It's good to see you all here today. So I would like for you to please open your Bibles uh, to our um, scripture for today. And we will be reading it through, not the whole chapter, uh, chapter 9, uh, but a big uh, chunk of that. This is the last um, in the series um, after today, after Romans, sorry, Acts chapter 9. Uh, we will be pausing this uh, the series and then we'll, we're going to shift to a sermon, a Christmas series. And um, I'm, I've, I've given the new series the title, The Meaning of Jesus. It's going to be a three-sermon series starting this coming Sabbath, essentially uh, taking um, uh, the, the account of, of Matthew uh, of, the, of the birth of Jesus Christ. Before we begin, would you please bow your heads as we pray. Father God, here we are once again. We're here because you've called us here, um, and we are grateful, and now we're ready, oh God, to hear from you. Uh, We are thirsty, we are hungry for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 9, the story of the conversion of Paul, and we're going to read through the first 19 verses. So hang hang tight, open your Bibles. If you brought your Bible with you, or if you'd like, it will be projected on the screen. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, the updated edition of that. Or you can read from from, uh, from the Pew Bible in front of you. Uh, whichever one you choose. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against, you know, let let me take it back. I want to read from chapter 8, verse 1, because I think that's where uh, we really need to to read, because that's where where we find uh, Saul's name, who we are accustomed to calling Paul, uh, where he first appears. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing him. Chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and through his eyes, or though his eyes were open, he could could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much He must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the the house. He laid his hands on Saul and, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. And his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, 
he regained his strength. And so we find the story, this marvelous story of conversion. Of the one person in the whole New Testament, of the whole history of Christianity, short of Jesus Christ, who's meant more to Christianity, arguably, than anyone ever since. How did it happen that this man who's bent on doing everything it takes to bring compliance to his version of faith and to use force, violence, in order to accomplish what he considers to be right. How is it that this man goes up and walks or rides up the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, breathing persecution, breathing death, to the disciples, to the um, believers of the day? How is it that when he returns to Jerusalem down that same road, the Damascus road, the man turns from a zealous, violent, zealous believer in the one God to one who would give his own life for the mission of God in Jesus Christ. How does a violent, zealous man turn into a passionate man consumed by the mission of spreading the good news to everyone? What changed for Paul? What happened on that road to Damascus? A conversion from Judaism, perhaps, to Christianity? Or is it something far bigger than that? And as we ask these questions and try to seek some answers, I'm, I'm reminded of, of some persons in my whole life who, you know, who had seen Jesus somehow, maybe not as powerfully or as literally as, as, as Paul did in his day, who, whose life also became changed when somehow or other they met Jesus Christ on their road to Damascus. And I'm referring to a... Um, uh, to a teacher of mine in, in college who, who was arguably one of the toughest guys in their, in their town. And he came, to, uh, we, I, when I came to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to college, to the college that I attended, he was known for his uh, history, for his BC life, his before Christ life. And now this guy was a thug and, and he, was, uh, he was someone who you did not want to cross with because if, if you did, he will let you know, and you, you're going to get hurt. And all of us um, students, um, uh, ministry students, were in awe of this, of this man because of what we saw in him and through him. And that all the stories that we had heard about him seemed so far-fetched, seemed so out of line, seemed so fantastic, because this man was nowhere near violent. He couldn't hurt a fly. What happened to him? And so a few of my enterprising, you know, uh, uh, conniving little imp of, you know, pastoral students, friends of mine, decided to, not just once, but several times that I can remember that I had seen, to test whether or not this, con this man's conversion is real. And so they would... They would actually, they, what they did to this day, it's still, you know, when I, when I see it with my mind's eye, I still, I still smile, I still uh, chuckle, I still laugh inside. Because it was really funny. They would trip the, uh, our professor, they would do everything they could, acting out in class, to make him lose his temper. And it was just not one person, it would be several persons at a time. And we would all be there sitting and we, we knew what was happening. We knew what was happening. Our poor professor was being set up. But every single time we did it, we failed. Except for one, that one time. He lost his temper and everybody, everybody couldn't believe what they just saw. He lost his temper. 
for the very first time, all of, the, all of the stuff that we were doing in order to goad this guy to lose his temper or to do anything to show his old self, he lost his temper. God forbid. But after class, something dramatic happened and we did not, I did not get to see this. A few of my friends saw it, they say. And so they related it to us. After class, what our professor did was he went to the person who goaded him and apologized profusely to him. And he did more than that. He went one by one to each student in that class that day and apologized to every single one of them for losing his temper. How does a violent man become a passionate missionary? How does a violent man become a lover of peace? The peace of Jesus Christ and the peace that surpasses all understanding. How does Paul become, how does Saul become Paul? Only by seeing this vision on the road to Damascus? Something more needs to be said. Imagine with me what Paul must have been like as a young man. Paul, our, um, by his own admission in his letters, was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was someone who was devoted to ensuring that the, uh, that the people of God who had been cast out into captivity, into um, uh, into the, in, into the various nations of the world because of their own uh, disobedience to God. A Pharisee, Paul was, and his whole family, perhaps. Imagine Saul as a young man growing in a, in a Greek city in the, in the now um, um, part of the world called Turkey, um, growing up in the midst of heathenism in the, in the midst of, 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 of polytheism and, and cultural relativism of the day. And imagine Saul imagining all of the people of God sprinkled all over the land and still fulfilling the punishment that they are receiving from their God because apparently, as Scripture tells us, that when the people of God rebelled against him, God kicked them out of their own land. And according to the Pharisees and their understanding of, of history and their understanding of, of Scripture, that the only way that God is going to bring them back to the land, to their own land, to the promised land, the only way for, for God to, to, to do all of those things that he promised is for the, the people of Israel, the Jews of the day, for them to be faithful in everything God command, commanded them to be faithful to. Imagine the, uh, Saul as a young man captivated by the story of, of his own people and captivated over the, the suffering that his people is going through. Because after all, um, they've gone through a lot and they've gone through a lot ever since then even after the death of Paul, but that's another story. I actually preached about that last Sabbath. I'm not going back and pre preach it again. Saul became impassioned. His, his soul burnt for his people and for the travails of his people. And he wanted to be the next person whom God would call to bring his people back to the promised land. Back to faithfulness to Yahweh, their God. Back to faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant that God made with their forefather Abraham. And imagine Saul, the young Saul, taking, taking all of that in and, and, and imagining or, or, or envisioning himself as giving his entire life, whatever it takes, to bring his people back to compliance to the will of God. 
And the Pharisees had a very specific vision as to how that is going to happen. Because of their unfaithfulness, the um, scripture tells us that God even left the one place on earth that unites heaven on earth, the one place where God sits and, 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 and uh, as, as one enthroned over the whole earth, the temple itself, the one place where heaven and earth meet in the temple where God's throne is symbolically placed. We find that at the very end of the life of the, of the kingdom of, of Judah, that God even le- left that temple. He left that temple and he's never been back. And the Pharisees and Paul himself was convinced that the only way for God to come back is for them to show more or a higher level of obedience to God. And to them and to, and to Saul, the, to young Saul, and to the Saul who was growing up as a, ze- uh, as a zealous uh, Pharisee, there, you know, the vision was pretty pretty. Uh, pretty simple. What do we do? The temple is empty. The most holy place is empty. The throne room of God is empty. They've never been able to find the Ark of the Covenant ever since the destruction of the first temple. God has not been back in his own place where heaven meets earth. And so Saul, a faithful Pharisee, thought that it is their faithfulness to the Torah, first of all, number one, that would be the basis for everything or the foundation for everything. And so they were very zealous for the for for the law and you know, and all of the provisions in the law to the minutiae. They were zealous for the Levitical uh, food law. They were zealous for the Sabbath. They were zealous for a lot of other things. Because to them, in the absence of a temple where God is in it, in the absence of that temple, the Torah is the movable temple for them. Wherever the Torah was, there God was. Or at least they thought or they wanted to think. And so they poured over the pages of the Torah. It was given to them. It's our heritage. And Saul, the young Saul, drank it all up, internalized it. And within the pages of Torah, he finds a tradition, a freedom tradition, a tradition that has been inculcated in the minds of of Pharisees and the children of Pharisees, not just Pharisees even. Even the zealots believed it. It is called the tradition of faithfulness based on the son of Levi by the name of Phineas. You might remember Phineas. Phineas... was one of the sons of, of, of Levi. And Phineas, if you go back to your Bibles in, uh, in Numbers chapter 25, you will find there Phineas, when the, uh, the people of God, on their way, during the Exodus, on the way from the, from, from the kingdom of Moab, when, they, when, when, when Balaam, Balak and Balaam could not persuade, could not, uh, when, when Balak could not persuade Balaam to, uh, to curse Israel, Balaam thought of a way to entice the people of God from becoming disloyal to him. And what did they do? What did Balaam do? He caused them to, to, to apostatize by, by sleeping with the women of Moab. And so we find in the book of Numbers that when that was happening and, and the people of God, the, the, the men, um, one by one started taking uh, women from the land 
And of course, these more likely, a lot of them were temple prostitutes. To foreign deities, foreign gods. And Phineas sees that. And Phineas says, does something that has become the bedrock of, of zeal for the people of God, especially for the zealots of the time, in the time of, of Paul, of Jesus Christ, especially by the Pharisees, causing them to justify violence in order to force erring Jews back to the fold. This is what Saul was doing when he was on his way to Damascus. He is, in his own twisted mind, he believed that he was doing the work of Phineas. What did Phineas do? He saw an Israelite man holding his newfound Moabite wife against the will of God, goes into his tent. And I can just imagine that, my, that man's Jewish wife, the chagrin on her face, but nonetheless, he goes in there with his newfound Moabite wife. Phineas saw, sees that, and he is consumed by passion for God. With passion for God. He takes a spear. He goes into the tent and skewers both of them to death. I'm sorry for our children to have, to have heard that. And there in, 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 um, in Numbers we find, Numbers 25, we find this amazing response from God. Verse 7, when Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he got up and left the congregation. Taking a spear in his hand, he went after the Israelite man into the tent and pierced the two of them, the Israelite and the woman, through the belly. And then verse 10, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath. From the Israelites by manifesting zeal, such zeal among them on my behalf, that in my jealousy I did not consume the Israelites. Saul must have read this over and over again and said to himself, Lord, I want to be the next Phineas for you because I want you back in your temple. And I want you to gather your people back from the diaspora into the Holy Land. And even in Psalms, we find this amazing, amazing um, statement in Psalm 106, verses 30 and 31. If you remember Abraham, when Abraham believed God, we are told in Scripture that God counted his faith, that belief, as his, as his righteousness. Well, here in Psalm 106, we find that what Phineas did that day was also counted for him as his righteousness. Also his righteousness. Then Phineas stood up and, and interceded and the plague was stopped. And that has been reckoned to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. That must have been on the mind of Saul as he rode up that, uh, the road to Damascus, as he trekked up that road to Damascus that day. And he must have been praying. As a matter of fact, in the Acts of the Apostles, or in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, we are told that he was actually praying. He must have been also thinking of other things. Like, for example, there was a tradition in the, in the, in the days of, of Saul um, um, about this, you know, this Ezekiel um, vision, which we find in Ezekiel chapter 1, this 
fantastic, this, this amazing uh, vision of God's movable throne. Of a wheel within a wheel within a wheel moving in so many different directions. And the four, and the four faces of the cherubim that were um, surrounding the throne. And there was a, there was a, um, there was a tradition uh, during the time of, Paul, of, of Saul, Paul, that, you know, that, 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 that kept the, um, that, that the, uh, the, the rabbis um, would not allow anybody below the age of 40 to read this text in Ezekiel chapter 1. Because it was such, you know, the vision was so amazingly beyond this world that, you know, a, a boy could just, you know, a boy's imagination could just run wild and do whatever he wants with it. And so they waited until about, you know, when, 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 a, when a man or a person is 40 years old. So we, we can imagine uh, Saul perhaps uh, already crossed that age line of 40 years old, you know, uh, riding on a donkey up that road from Jerusalem to, um, uh, to Damascus. He was praying. He must have been praying. He must have been meditating on these things. And he must have also been meditating this Ezekiel, this wonderful vision of the movable throne of God. And he must have, as the vision tells us, he must have followed that, you know, that movable wheel within a wheel, within a wheel, within a wheel, up to the throne room of God itself, because the vision actually takes us there to the throne, all the way to the throne. Verse 26, Ezekiel chapter 1. And above the dome over their heads, there was something like a throne in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of the throne was something that seemed like a human form. A human form. I can imagine Saul just meditating and praying and imagining that vision of Ezekiel and wanting it for himself as he draws closer and closer and closer to the throne room of God, he could almost see that, that one like the Son of Man, or one like the Son of Man, according to Ezekiel, seated on the throne. He could almost see him. He could almost see him. And when he does see him, the light shines from the throne, and the, guy, and, and the man seated on the throne reveals his face. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus. That was the, the least, least of all what Paul or Saul would have expected. And ever since then, Saul has never been the same. Because now Saul realizes That all the promises of God made to Abraham, all the promises to the people of God, has just now been realized in the person of the resurrected Christ, who he thought was still dead, and certainly not the Messiah. And so you see, Saul was not converted that day much in the same way we think of conversion today. He was not converted from one religion to the next and kept everything else the same. No. Saul was not converted on the road to Damascus. What happened on the road to Damascus was the real, realization of his wildest dreams only held upside down because the face that ended up showing himself to him, seated on the throne perhaps, was the one person he thought was dead. Jesus Christ. And so the the faith of Abraham 
finally became, or the, the realization of the faith of Abraham finally came true that day on the road to Damascus. And I think to myself, we are really a lot like Saul. I mean, you know, we've, how many of you have spent all your lives in church in, in, as, as Christians? Can you still even remember when you were not Christian? You've been Christian all your lives, it seems like. And it is you that needs also this, your own Damascus road. You don't need conversion. What you need is Jesus Christ. And if we are to live like Saul lives, he was never the same after that day. Because the man who went to, to Damascus with a letter from the priest came back with a letter, not a written letter, from Jesus Christ. And the man who went up to persecute uh, people in Damascus came back the persecuted. And the man who went up to Damascus causing much suffering to people came back the man of suffering himself. As Jesus said, I must show him how much he must, he must suffer for me. You see, when Christianity becomes more than just a religion and becomes a passion for a person, it becomes a totally different thing. I don't want to be a person who is a Christian, necessarily. I don't want to be in the religion of Christianity. I want to be someone who is in love and passionate with Jesus Christ because he has shown himself to me. And that's what changed the life of Saul and made him into Paul. You ever wonder why Saul or Paul became so, such an energizer bunny I mean, he was all over the place. I mean, he, you know, he, he sacrificed an entire, his entire life became the mission field for God. And so can our lives be as well. But we must stop thinking ourselves belonging to a religion or even to a denomination and we must see ourselves as belonging to a person. If indeed that person has shown himself to you. And if he hasn't, by God, pray that he does. Because without that person, your experience is just religion. And while religion is good, it's not good enough for the mission. Only a passion for Jesus will make us go to the ends of the world, not religion. And religion is not what won the day that day. It was Jesus Christ. Because when Saul, meditating on Ezekiel chapter 1, imagines himself enraptured closer and closer to the throne room of God, he was intending to see the Father. And that would have been good too. But it was Jesus that showed himself to Paul. And because of that, Paul lived the rest of his life for him. Are you ready to do the same? We're not here for anything else and for anyone else. What is your Damascus road? What is your Damascus road? What must change in you 
in order for your faith to become about one person instead of one religion. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face, countenance upon you and give you peace. You are beloved. Go in, the, go in Jesus' name. Amen.